I'm Nick Papanicolaou, and I am the VP of Business Development at New Brand Ventures, which is a subsidiary of Pernod Ricard. Uh, just as quick background, um, New Brand Ventures is kind of a hybrid of an internal incubator where we take some of our own brands that we think have potential but had never really been given the, the love and care to, to succeed and to scale. And the other component of it is working with external entrepreneurial-led brands to bring them in through minority or majority partnerships and help, un help them unlock value. So, um, so the theme of today is about the changing M&A landscape and in particular how strategics look differently at M&A. So I focused my topic a little bit about in this evolving changing landscape that Nick referred to earlier, there is increasingly the need for brands to break through. And I'm not talking about just from a financial perspective, I'm talking about from a differentiation perspective, from a brand perspective. Are you filling a need in the market that actually exists? So yes, suppliers are obviously eager to invest. If you look at, at what's driving growth in this industry, um, we say about 60% of it comes from innovation, and innovation is broken into two things. Line extension innovation, which I feel like a lot of people in the audience might not actually classify as true innovation, but that's about 30% of the growth. And then the other 25 to 30% is new to world innovation, which is what many of you probably in the audience are doing. So, Innovation is driven largely or in large part by new and emerging brands like yourselves. The graph on the left here, this is actually um, credit to the Craft Spirits Project and, and Harry and Park Street for some of the work that went into this, but you can see that the case volume of Craft Spirits producers has been growing at about 25% a year over the last five years. I don't think on the, on the right side of that left graph, I don't think that's Park Street's actual projections. I think that's just different scenario analyses, but it's pretty remarkable to see that the industry is probably going to grow another two to three times over the next five years. So clearly this is of interest to us and a big driver of returns. On the right, I think this is a fantastic graph, another ripoff. I didn't do any work on this page. This is from ADI and Copper Sea Distilling. And I think it's to show a quick kind of analogy to the craft beer space. I'm not going to comment whether I think spirits is going to exceed or be below what craft beer is, but just as a corollary, you can see that craft beer has on, been on roughly a, a 30 to 40 year super cycle and still growing, although softening. And craft spirits is probably 10 to 15 years into that. So we're definitely less than halfway, if you believe this story, maybe a third of the way uh, through that growth cycle. So we're definitely excited about this. Now, in that changing landscape, what's interesting is that, quite frankly, the number of targets breaking through is becoming fewer and fewer. Um, this page we did create. So the, the graph on the left is from uh, Nielsen data. It's certainly not all-encompassing uh, for the market, but what you can see is that what we would classify as potential breakthrough brands is about 10 to 15 percent of the total market. So we think about 10 to 15 percent of the brands out there have the potential to be breakout stars purely from a, a, a size scalability perspective. Um, now what you actually see is on the graph on the right, you see fewer and fewer of those brands are actually breaking through. So this is now brands that were below the 15,000 case mark, I think it was below five or 10,000 cases, that have broken above 15,000 cases within three years. So that number has, has decreased by more than half from almost 6% in 2010 to Brands in 2015 that three years later, meaning 2018, have broken through that 15,000 case threshold is declining pretty dramatically. What does that mean? So this page, by the way, I had, I had some valuation metrics on, but I generally don't like to put them because I think it, it anchors the audience perhaps on the wrong message. So a lot of these, so, so what does this mean? This means that the brands that are breaking through are going to attract a lot of interest from strategics. And probably they're going to demand above market um, valuations or multiples. I'm sure you've heard of some of the valuations for some of these brands. So again, it's not worth talking about. <laughs> but the point is they are breaking through and garnering a lot of interest. I also want to caveat this page by saying, you know, for every five brands like this that break through and demand a 17 to 20x revenue multiple in Casamigos case, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of brands that are not getting deals done or, the, or that are getting deals done at much lower multiples. So again, the point of this is just to say brands are breaking through and it's <laughs> garnering a lot of interest from the strategics. <clears throat> so what does that mean? Well, for us, there are kind of two ways now that we look at 
um, at uh, an ability for brands to break through. Um, one is from a brand building perspective, this page, the next page is on, on business models and, and kind of new delivery channels. So I'll walk you through, this is kind of six criteria we look at from a brand building perspective with ultimately the goal that we think consumer centricity is key. I've talked in the past on another panel where I actually said that I think launching a brand, by, by the way, I myself launched a brand, so this is not a criticism of, of everyone out there by any means, but when I launched it, it, it was actually rather an egotistical move if you think about it. I had this idea in my head where I said, I have this great idea, everybody's gonna come, it's a build it and they will come mentality. And I think that, that model is broken, that doesn't work, and you need to be consumer focused. You need to be really understanding what the market need is and then hopefully kind of testing and iterating and improving your proposition based on market feedback. But really quickly, I'll go through each six. So the first, energy. So does the brand have energy? Um, is it something that we need to keep spending money to continue to get the word out or will there be some kind of virality based on the energy that's around that proposition? Voice. Is there a tone of voice that's kind of authentic and clear? Does that tone of voice have energy as well? Tangibility. So to me, this means, you know, are you rooted, are you rooted in some kind of brand purpose that's very like lofty and idealistic, very meta? Or is it something tangible that a salesperson can say, I know how to take that and convert that to POS or to messaging or to last three feet materials? Differentiation, this is your typical USP. Again, are you, are you differentiated enough in market? But we also look at, are you differentiated enough, of course, in our portfolio, in our distributors portfolio, and in the retailers, some of the large retailers that we tend to work with. Relevancy, so uh, this is, you know, you can have a fantastic brand purpose and emotional connection, but if it's not culturally relevant today, if this is a, a theme of 50 years ago, who cares? Like it has to be culturally relevant today. And we have to be able to see that for the foreseeable future, that is on trend. And then lastly, alignment. Is everything in your marketing ecosystem aligned? You know, when you talk about your brand purpose, you can see a lot of the things I'm talking about today are not related to product function, functional benefits or rational benefits, is around emotional benefits. So how does this align in your ecosystem? Your brand purpose, does it resonate in your social media, in your sales materials, in your, in your POS, et cetera? So that's on the brand building side. On the new business models, um, quite frankly, this might be a little bit of a stretch to say these are all new business models, but I think they are kind of alternative ways to, um, and alternative channels to grow your, your brand that we've seen some new brands increasingly do. So off-premise, just very simply, I think the traditional model of build it in the on-premise with the trade and people will learn about it and then they'll go to the off-premise to buy it. I think that, not that that's broken, but there's so much money and so many brands going towards that that we like to see occasionally brands say, you know what, I'm going to do it in a different way. And the off-premise is a certainly viable and more cost-efficient way to do that. Locality and regionality. I think the days of national breakout brands are, are probably behind us or certainly fewer and, and further between now. Um, you know, we'd probably rather see, we'd probably string, rather string together a group much like the ABI uh, uh, strategy stringing together a bunch of regional successes. So maybe it's a, a, a New England spirit that has, you know, 40% market share in New England rather than that same spirit going to all 50 states getting 2% market share. Then you've probably all been hearing about this idea of non-premise as kind of a, a replacement to on-premise. It's in Mark Brown kind of every other week here. I think that's really interesting. We've seen a lot of brands say, again, screw the traditional model. I'm going to go to, to festivals, to music con you know, conferences, to music events, things like that, and really try to generate um, kind of a new audience that they wouldn't get through the traditional channels. The visitor center model we think is very interesting, and I know a lot of you out there do as well. Um, obviously, you know, one of the clear benefits of this is getting higher margins, higher profitability. But I think the, the flip side of that is the scalability is, is pretty limited. What we've seen a few smart brands do is actually say, how can we open multiple visitor centers, bars, tasting rooms, either across states or depending on state regulation, even within the same state. And then finally, direct to consumer is a new business model. This is definitely a misused word because I don't, I don't really think direct to consumer actually legally exists other than at your own facility or, uh, or tasting room. But having said that, I think using some of the e-commerce players out there, the mini bars, Drizzlies of the world, is a fantastic way to kind of gather data 
to be super um, hyper focused on your tribe, gather data, and then iterate messaging and proposition based on that. So that's the last slide for me. I just want to kind of summarize that I think um, you know the way we're looking at it. There's clearly an evolving landscape, as, as Nick mentioned. There's distributor consolidation happening, more and more brands coming to market. So you're kind of hit with two on two sides of it: more brands coming to market and a, a bigger bottleneck to get through. And what's really resonating to us is brands that can figure out how to break through in that changing environment. The two biggest ways that we see are from a salient brand proposition and from unique or alternative business models or, or delivery channels. Thanks, everybody.